we will talk about the motivation of the work. And the second part, I will introduce our definition of error mitigation um, and uh, the connection with error correction. So the third one is uh, based on our, our definition of me error mitigation, we have uh, raised some question. For example, how do we actually invert a quantum channel? So I will talk about our results in this part. And also after, after set up all the questions and the way uh, raise another question, which is a lot of proto protocols in, in uh, quantum error mitigation, they assume noise to be perfectly known, but um, so, which is um, not always true. So we would like to know what would happen if we don't know the noise so well. So the last part is wrapping up the results. Okay. So um, the motivation of this work is pretty straightforward. So first of all, there is a lot of protocols called error mitigation recent, recent, in recent years, but none of the um, work actually explained, formally formulate or explain what actually is error mitigation. So we kind of get an intuition over there, but no formal definition. So that, that's the first question we want to ask. The second one is, what's the relation of error mitigation with error correction? So basically, they're all trying to fight against the noise in the real devices. And so what's the re relation between them? It's also a very interesting question. The last question is, if there is no theory for error mitigation as a whole, so can we develop a theory of, for error mitigation? So these are the motivation and the question that we want to solve in, in this work. OK, so the second part is, um, error mitigation and error correction. Before I go talk about our definition of error mitigation, I want to recap some of fundamental uh, concepts uh, of quantum related to quantum channels. Um, so the first one is called CP, which is short for completely positive. So if a linear map phi, phi is completely positive, that means the map tensor identity is also positive. Um, the, for the, sec the second definition is Hermitian preserving. A Hermitian preserving map phi is a map, uh, is a linear map that takes a Hermitian operator map to another Hermitian operator. So the last one, the last one is trace preserving. So trace preserving map is like the name indicates, the map preserves the trees. The operator before passing through the map or before the action of the map the trace will equal to the operator pass through the map. OK, so what's quantum channels? Quantum channels is a CPTP map, which is completely positive and the trace preserving. And uh, CP, which is completely positive, uh, has, has to be Hermitian preserving. OK, so if you if, if uh, there is someone not very familiar with this concept, there is a very good um, reference uh, over here. All right, okay, so let's take a look at the uh, error correction first. So this is a very high level perspective. Classical error correction, um, the most famous one is the repetition code. So what's the repetition code is if you want to send a uh, zero through your channel, you actually encode it several times. For, uh, in this case, it's three times. So it introduce some redundancy, then you can do some statistic to infer your information. This is the classical error correction. Uh, sure, nine qubit code is also in the similar uh, sense, which is encoding one quantum state, uh, one qubit into nine qubits. So in this very high level picture, we can see error correction. What error correction do is actually encoding your message or your state into a higher dimensional space and uh, let it pass through the noise to recover the information. And we, in the setting of quantum communication, we hope the state or input state and output state to be as similar as possible. So we want to preserve the, the state. Okay, and all the work is, uh, all the, the most important work is we actually introduce redundancy in the encoding parts. 
All right. Um, so recent, in recent years, there is a lot of protocols called quantum error mitigation being published. So there is probability, uh, probabilistic uh, error cancellation, zero error extrapolation, and uh, virtual dil dilation, and the measurement error, and a lot of methods that um, are introduced. Um, this is a very good uh, s summary work. Uh, so it's not a totally about um, error mitigation, but they have a session of error mitigation that do a good job of summary uh, those protocols. So we want to ask the question, what is actually error, what actually error mitigation is? So there is a lot of the, the fundamental setting is like this. So in, in the language of quantum circuits, we have several layer of quantum circuits. The U sub I actually is um, the desired unitary or the desired circuit that we want to implement. And we have several layers of the circuits. And by assuming the, the by making the Markovian assumption, every layer of noise, every layer of operation, you we got a, Arrow, arrow channel over here or noise channel over here. So the the goal of um, error mitigation is make the error mitigated result as close as possible to the ideal result that we want. So this is very straightforward. And so the, there is a lot of work trying to formulate or unite, unite several of those protocols. For example, this is one of the, the effort not people have been trying to unite. Like, uh, so I think that in this paper, they united um, three different uh, protocols. So with all these previous work, we were thinking actually what um, error mitigation is. We actually, the mitigation is trying to um, mitigate error for the experiment results. What's mitigation mean is actually trying to achieve this channel inverse. So um, the experimental outcome have a distance from the ideal outcome because the error and the, the errors are layer by layer. So we can basically writing an effective channel in channel noise channel by the end. And the, the goal of error mitigation is should be try to invert the um, error channel over here. So, so this is pretty straightforward and uh, we can, oh, what we ever trying to do is trying to achieve this channel inverse. Okay, so, so from this, uh, go back to the, this very high level perspective, we can see, okay, error correction is in, doing encoding and let it goes through channel and the recovery. Um, so all the process are physical. That means the, the, the channels and the maps should be CPTP, should be uh, quantum channels. But um, because error mitigation, we don't have to be physical. For example, we can then tweak the um, measurement result for a little bit, uh, not just like implementing circuits in your hard device. So that's why the, the inverse channel does not need to be CPTP anymore. Okay, so, but this will, would raise a question. Why that's the case is because error mitigation usually doesn't include in the encoding process, which means we, it sounds like we don't actually need a larger Hilbert space to achieve a perfect um, uh, inversion or protect our information. Is this something wrong? Does it violate the information theory? Because um, because error correction is always need to uh, need to extend the the uh, introduce the redundancy. Okay. To answer this question, let's take a look at the classical setting first. So in the classical setting, when we want to send a message through a channel, it's encoded in a string of uh, zero and one uh, bit string. Um, and let's think about a very simple noise channel in classical setting. 
that uh, that is called binary symmetric channel. That uh, the channel means it has probability p to um, flip the beat and have the probability one minus p to keep the beat at the same um, uh, as untouched. Um, so the what the binary bi binary symmetric channel do is like this. Um, because we are in the classical setting, we know that in the classical setting, the, the if we only have di diagonal entries in the density matrix, that's purely classical. So so this density matrix is pure. It's uh, representing the classical setting, and the row zero zero is actually the probability of the string has zeros, and the um, row one one is the probability of the string the um, the probability of one. So what the channel does is mapping the row zero zero and the row one one to the primes. And it also because why why this is a density matrix and this writing as vector is because we uh, I already said um, classical setting is the the ones only have uh, diagonal entries which is non-zero and the, the non-diagonal entries are zero. So you can just simply write that as a vector. Um, so if we purely know, if we have all the knowledge of the channel, we know the channel is mm, the binary symmetric channel, and we know the probability of flipping P, so we can just directly calculate the channel inverse. And for and by acting the channel inverse, we can actually purely uh, cancel the cancel the effect of the channel. But what we're actually getting out of the, the, the error mitigation process is we get the probability of one and zeros in, in your in your bit string. We only get the probability, but not the message itself. We cannot actually determine which one get flipped out, which one did not. So it doesn't actually recover the message. So that is basically saying without the encoding, um, the error mitigation is not going to save the world. OK, so let's take a look at the quantum setting first uh, for now. Um, so in this celebrated uh, work by Charles Bernard, by Charles Bernard and his uh, co-authors, um, they proved that quantum error correction is equal to the 1EPP, which is the one-way entanglement purification protocols. protocols and, and they Basically, they prepare a bear, a bell state and uh, share with two parties. Um, in the one EPP protocols, they can use m pairs of the bell state and the to mm, distillate the k pairs, which k less than n. Um, essentially, you can still see the in encoding or the um, the redundancy from here because n is larger than k. But for in this setting, what error mitigation means is, for example, if you have uh, the Bob part, Bob's part that goes through some local noise channel and you try to implement the noise inverse over here, you indeed can improve some uh, the local result, measurement result from Bob's side, but uh, you completely lost the quantum resource, which is the entanglement over here. So we can see that um, quantum error correction is the follow the information theory and uh, introduce redundancy, but it but it maintain the quantum co coherence and the entanglement such like uh, the resource like this. And for quantum error mitigation, so there are kind of traditional and the new uh, or new algorithms that uh, try to achieve that channel inverse and try to give you better local data, but it doesn't actually preserve the resources. OK, so this is the relation between error mitigation and the error correction. So in our, oh, uh, as I talked to um, Pedro before, we are actually working on our the revision revision of our paper. So we actually have a follow up uh, result, which um, we proved that that uh, quantum error mitigation doesn't improve um, channel capacity, but uh, error correction can improve channel capacity. So we will update the draft soon, and um, yeah, probably can see the result very uh, quick. All right. Um, so the third part is if we are trying to, we get the you know idea of 
quantum error mitigation is trying to do the channel inverse to the system by classical and quantum ways. So by we can implement some gates and also we can tweak the measurement result for a little bit in the classical way. Um, so in general, it's easy to, it's very natural to ask the question, in general, how do we invert a quantum channel? So before I talk about how to invert the quantum channel, I want to recap some of the knowledge of uh, channel representations. So there are several ways of representing channels. And uh, because in quantum error mitigation, we usually do the encoding um, stuff. So in this setting, it's more natural to set the input dimension and the output dimension as the same. Um, normally, so in this graph shows four type of um, representations of quantum channel. The first one is the Troy matrix. And the second one is probably the one most familiar with, with the, among physicists is the cross, represent, cross operators. Um, and there is uh, another representation called the super operator we will use a lot in this in this work, and we will also talk about Choi representation a lot. And this stern spring uh, representation usually used when we also considering the environment. Uh, so we, we're not going to talk too much about this in, in this work. Um, so this graph is from this citation. All right. Um, so here is some of the definition. Cross operator is probably the most familiar one. Um, the cross operator, if you can find a, a, a set of cross operator and this is how it acts. And uh, it's the mostly common used one. And also the second the one is the Choi representation. Choi representation is a Choi matrix, um, now also called Choi matrix. This is the definition. The E sub AB is the Choi matrix. Uh, what's choi what's choi basis is is the a b's entry of your matrix is one other entries are zero that's the choi basis um so the choi representation is the sum of this and the channel acting on this part uh, so in some of the book it will, the channel acting on the first part and the, they are equivalent um why choi representation is very famous or very popular among um, mathematicians is because the the it very good it very simply show the property of the channel. For example, if the Choi representation is Hermitian, then the channel is Hermitian preserving. So if the partial trace of this um, Choi representation is an identity, then the channel is a trace preserving um, is a trace preserving map. So if this is positive then the channel is completely positive. Um, super operator is actually reshuffling entries from Troy representation, and that will uh, show you how by uh, example. But super operator usually used for calculation. Why that's so useful, you can see from this definition, uh, from this um, equation. V rho is actually the vectorization of density matrix. What, how does the vectorization do is if you have a density matrix, you take columns and stack them together to a longer vector. That's the vectorization of quantum state. Um, so Vn is the super operator of the channel. And uh, how does the channel acting on the quantum state is just by simply by a matrix multiplication. So this is so this is very straightforward. So that that is why it's very good for calculation. Um, here is a simple example. You can um, this is the Troy representation of one of the quantum channel. Um, so how do we transfer from the Troy representation to super operator? Is you can see we can we can write this block into a column vector and put it over here. And the, the bottom um, the bottom left one, we write as a vector and put it here. So vice versa. So this is how we transfer from Troy representation to super operators. OK, so do a little bit of recap. So we know that Troy matrix is very good at seeing the property, but it's not very convenient for the calculation. So the 
it's not impossible, but not as convenient as the super operator. That's why people always use super operator to calculate. Um, the class representation is actually pretty convenient for calculation and for seeing the properties, but it's not very great for doing the inverse because that that's the operator sum. You got a two operator and a sum over there, so it's uh, not direct, not very straightforward to see the inverse. OK, so let's go back to the question of inverter content channel. So the previous, of course, people have considered about um, the inverter quantum channel, but previous works mainly focus on the CPTP inverse. It's basically because, um, you know, we in quantum error correction, we always considering things are being physical. Physical means you, you all your maps, all your strategies need to be CPTP. So that's why people always consider CPTP inverse. So one of the very famous one and also relate uh, one of the famous one is called the PADS recovery. Um, so it's it's a very useful tool to prove a lot of theorems and uh, it related to the pretty good measure. So it's very significant, uh, has very significant theoretical meaning. Um, and there is also other CPTP inverse. So because, you know, people doesn't get a, you know, um, intuition or uh, like uh, motivation to work with that. Uh, with other inverse, so that's that's why the previous work all more more or less concentrated on the CPTP parts. Um, but we just want because because we know the quantum channel or because we know the error mitigation map inverse doesn't have to be CPTP anymore because we don't have to always implement gates on, on error mitigation. So it doesn't need to be CPTP. So we just start to look at the question by itself. So the, the, the simple case would be the invertible case. Invertible case, why it's simple is by the representation of linear maps, um, we know the channel, uh, the quantum channel is invertible if and only if the super operator is an invertible channel, in, invertible matrix. And the inverse of the channel, uh, it's equal to the, the inverse of the representation. Oh, actually, this is a little bit like um, not very straightforward to say, but uh, it's straightforward to see from this. Um, the super operator of the inverse channel is e equal to the super operator inverse and uh, the, the the inverse of the super operator. Yeah, that's it. Um, OK, so uh, from the previous work, we know that only unitary channels have CPTP inverse. Otherwise, they are HPTP. Um, so from this paper, you can see the first part of the result. And uh, in this paper, they provide the proof for um, the, the, the channel inverse is always the, for the invertible case, the channel inverse is always HPTP. OK, so uh, this proposition. OK, so uh, for, from this paper, we know that the non-zero part of the spectrum of a CPTP map, which is in our case, we care about the super operator, the spectrum of the super operator. Um, so for the non-zero part of the spectrum, the, the CPTP map, uh, the spectrum has the modular of those uh, eigenvalues or the spectrum has to be equal or less to one. So from this result, we derived, uh, very easily derived this proposition one, which is basically saying if your channel has a eigenvalue which is modular so less than one, for example, it's a half, then your inverse cannot be CP anymore. It will be a HPTP map, not CPTP. OK, so what's this proposition to us? First of all, we, we know that a CPTP inverse cannot deal with those part. Because, you know, because, because the, uh, the CPTP inverse, CPTP map spectrum has to be uh, less or equal to one. So so it doesn't if you have uh, like an um, eigenvalue which is less than one, then you cannot deal with it. That's that's pretty straightforward. But those 
um, eigenvalue has modulars less than one. It's basically inevitable if you have some kind of classical mix. For example, this is a, a one qubit um, polychannel. So you can see because those uh, classical mix, pr classical probability over here. So basically, the the super operator of these of these um, poly operators or poly channels then uh, will definitely have those spectrum which is strictly less than one. So from the second point from this, what the, the prop, what's the proposition one telling us? The second point is from a high perspective, high level perspective. That's why quantum error correction need, need redundancy, because it need to reduce the classical uncertainty. Um, by introduce the redundancy, then you can you can have all those um, error like all, all those all those um, state which which are perpendicular to each other. Then you can kind of um, kind of. By measuring the stabilizer, then you know what kind of error happened. Then you basically reduce the classical uncertainty. And if you know what kind of error happened, then you can try to recover it. But of course, that's a high level. But this proposition told why told us why you no know, error correction need a redundancy. You cannot directly implement a CPTP inverse to make things better. Okay. Um, so we already see the invertible case, which is directly, you know, invert the super operator. Uh, the non-invertible case is a little bit more challenge. The first the challenge is if it's if it is a non-invertible channel, a non-invertible um, um, CPTP map, then the generalized inverse is not unique. So we we have to pick one. Um, so. But the, the most commonly one is the pen, more Penrose inverse. So, the, so of course, with the first thing we want to try is for trying the more Penrose inverse. And the second challenge is we are working on the ways the super operators. Um, they are not very good of observing those properties like I, I, I introduced before. Um, so this is one of the example of a non-invertible channel over here. So this is the channel's choice representation, and we rewrite it uh, as a super operator over here. Um, so we try to calculate the pan, the more Penrose inverse of this uh, this channel, and they look like this. And we write it back to the choice representation of this more Penrose inverse, and we can check the the channel that you can see it actually is symmetric, which means it's Hermitian, and also that means the map is Hermitian preserving. But you can see the partial trace. You can add them together. Um, to, after partial trace, the 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 channel is not a unit, uh, is not an identity, so that means it's not a trace preserving map. So basically, that tells us okay, more parallels inverse probably not working so well, because the the inverse, the generalized, this generalized inverse does it's not trace preserving anymore. It may give you a lot of trouble, because trace preserving means a lot. Um, basically means you preserve the probability bypass through a channel. So we 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 now know the more parallels inverse doesn't work. Okay, so. If the more parallel inverse doesn't work, then we are trying to construct a, or construct one. We call it a quasi inverse. Uh, mathematically, it's all it also called Dyson Dryden inverse. Okay, so the intuition the intuition is if the super operator's eigen structure has to carry some information, why that's the case is because um, from this paper, um, we know that the spectrum of the channel has to um, the spectrum radius of the channel equal to one. That means all the spectrums, uh, the modulars of the eigenvalues has to be equal to or less than one. And we from that we kind of uh, can think the eigenvector has to also satisfy kind of some, some kind of condition to make things happen, to make the map CPTP. OK, so so we got kind of got the intuition that the eigen structure definitely have to carry information. If that's the case, then, you know, I, if we try to construct the inverse, then I will try my best to, to preserve the structure. 
So the first thing we want to do is definitely, oh, if you want to uh, preserve the spectrum structure, then you want to do a spectrum decomposition. Um, but the small challenge is because the super operator is rearranging the entries from uh, from from the uh, from the tree representation, so it can be it could be very and you, it will be very often be defective, which means it doesn't have the spectrum de decomposition anymore. But we will try to like do it um, as much as possible. So what we did is do the Jordan decomposition to the super operator. This is the Jordan decomposition to the super operator, and the, the Q and the Q inverse carries the eigenvector and the generalized eigenvector of this rep, of the super operator, and the J the J is the Jordan form, and we built our quasi inverse in such a way, we kept those Q Q and the Q inverse, and we construct J prime, and the how we construct the J prime is. This is one of the Jordan block of the of the previous channel. So what we do is we if lambda i doesn't equal to zero, it's invertible. So we just invert it. So the so the corresponding Jordan block in, in your J prime will be it's not a Jordan block anymore, but it's a but it's a it's a upper triangular matrix. It will be look like this. So um, this is how the whole thing looks like. So if we have uh, several blocks, if the lambda sub i it doesn't equal to zero, then you can just invert it. And if we have the, because we are dealing with the non-invertible case, so we definitely going to have some zeros or a new potent matrix. So the new potent matrix by definition is the the matrix that um, has a, has all zero on the main diagonal and the ones on the sub diagonal and the, all other places are zero. So this is the neopotent matrix. Um, so for the neopotent matrix, we just um, we just sub uh, all zero matrix for the J prime over here. OK, so this is how we construct the quasi inverse. And we of course, we want to prove the results or show it the, it's better than the it's better than the more apparent inverse because we already know the more apparent inverse can be not trace preserving. But the challenge is, as as I already said, you know, super operator doesn't. It's not very good for observing those properties. So first, first people usually think, you know, you, you can't actually prove any property straight from the super operator. So this is the big challenge. Um, but later, it's later we found it's actually provable, and uh, we we proved it in the paper. Um, so. We want to prove that the quasi inverse we built is actually trace preserving, um, while the more apparent inverse is not trace preserving. So if we are talking about trace preserving, first of all, we need to define trees. Um, trees in the in the normal case, it's of course you just add the diagonal entries together. But uh, super operator is acting on the vector vectorization of uh, of the density matrix. What we do is we define the the, the S trace in the vectorization um, is actually equivalent uh, equivalent result from the from, from the normal trace. Uh, we just need uh, this to start. So what we find in the lemma one and the two is the if if the your eigenvalue is not uh, not equal to one, um, or your eigenvalues and the eigen and uh, the generalized eigenvalues need to be trace zero or as trace zero. So that actually is a very strong um, condition. And the lemma two told us if you have like a Jordan block with eigenvalue one and the all the eigenvectors except the last one, except the last generalized eigenvectors, they also have to be trace one, a uh, trace zero. So this is what the lemma two told us. And uh, so after observing these two lemmas, we, we basically just, because uh, cause remembering, uh, recall that we, how we construct the quasi inverse is we kept the Q and the Q inverse and changed the J prime in the middle. Um, so we basically kept those cues around. So that's why we, that's why we 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 get a lot of benefit from the previous map to be to be CPTP. 
and uh, eventually we proved that the quasi inverse is a trace preserving map uh, of a trace preserving map is also trace preserving. Yeah, so we theoretically proved that um, our construction is better than the more parallel inverse. Okay, so this is the non invertible example from the previous uh, slides. Um, yeah, this is the super operator of this channel. And we can see the Jordan, uh, the Jordan block is actually pretty nice over here. They are diagonal matrix. And we can see the eigenvalues are 0, 1, and uh, no, 2 over 5, 1 over 5. And by inverting those numbers, you can see, OK, we got um, 5 over 2 and 5 over here. So you can exactly see, OK, these, so the, so, so the inverse map cannot be CPT, CP anymore. It has to be HP. And the we calculate the result uh, by our construction. We, we, we construct the quasi inverse and um, we write it in the Troy matrix. Then you can see, OK, so first of all, it's symmetric. So it's Hermitian preserving. Um, then you can see the, the partial trace. It's um, tra uh, partial trace is identity. Then you know it's trace preserving. So so like from this example, you can see, OK, even the form of this, this inverse is a little bit easier than the more apparel inverse uh, we, we see before. So we kind of know we, we probably did something right and also we proved it. OK, so this is how the how the quasi inverse and the more apparel inverse work. Um, so the X axis is the 50 randomly generated uh, quantum states, and the Y axis is the expectation value of uh, measuring poly X. Um, so the purple circle over here is the ideal um, expectation value of poly X. What that mean is we, we randomly generated those states and we just directly measure the poly X, and that's the results. And the, the, the N, which is the small red dot over here, is when the channel, when the quantum state goes through the noise channel, then after it goes through the noise channel, we measure the poly X. So this is the noisy results. And the, the uh, green triangle over here is, is our quasi inverse recovery. And uh, this um, Blue circle is the more parallel inverse recovery. So you can see that um, our recovery, the quasi inverse, is actually perfectly uh, recover the information of poly X. It's perfectly lies in the in the purple circle. While the while the poly um, while the more parallel inverse actually sometimes make the results worse. Okay, so. Um, f from our construction, we we we, we get a you know, get an idea that if our if some there's some of the state uh, which is perpendicular to the null space, then our uh, quasi inverse can perfectly perfectly reconstruct the uh, or preserve these states. So this is why um, the green one, which is our uh, construction, perfectly uh, the fidelity is one. Uh, while the, the, the more parallel inverse not very great sometimes. Um, so the red one is the noisy results. OK, so these are the uh, the second graph. It's also the 50 randomly generated um, uh, qubits results. And that's the average uh, fidelity. And we can see that the more parallel inverse, sometimes it's even making the result worse. You can see the uh, the the uh, red bar is the noisy result. And so you can see sometimes the more parallel inverse actually making the fidelity worse. So it's not a good sign. So um, yeah, that's um, that's the numerical results for, for that example. Yeah. Uh, I just yeah. have a question. Like I want to sure. understand what, what is happening with this quasi inverse or the generalized inverse. So, so the idea is that you have a non-invertible map in the sense that the uh, vectorized well the matrix form is non invertible right and then yep, that's correct these well either the generalized inverse or the quasi inverse what it does is uh, it inverts say a soft space of that map or am yeah, I uh, so yeah, yeah that's correct uh, it's actually a okay. very good question so what what's the more parallel inverse does is actually try the best to preserve the singular value construct 
uh, singular value property. That's why it was not uh, not so great um, from the definition of more Penrose inverse that that uh, you you can you can check the more Penrose inverse uh, construction. It has a uh, a and a, a star, so so it's the singular value structure over here to carry the more Penrose inverse. So uh, and we we already proved in the lemma one and the two is actually the eigenstructure carries the information. So the, the singular value information is actually maxing up the, the, the stuff. Yeah, that's why why our quasi inverse is better than the more parallel inverse. All right, okay. Okay, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Okay. So besides we actually numer we numerically calculated and also proved that um, our construction is better than the commonly used more parallel inverse. Um, we also find a, a new perspective of the super operator because previously, you know, what people always do is, you know, when we just calculate super operator, or we'll calculate the, the, the results from the super operator, then change to other representation. Uh, that's what usually happened. But, well, but we actually find that the eigenstructures carry a lot of property. Um, just like the, the question I got before, you know, the eigenstructure is actually the thing, actually the thing makes things happen. So that's why, you know, a lot, why, why a lot of things work in the better in, in this, in this construction. And also, um, so our discovery won't, you know, replace Troy representation or anything, but, uh, you, you know, it make it possible to work with the support operator and the, increase in, enhance the understanding of the super op operator so this is like another benefit from from the from the theorem too okay so the the fourth the the fourth part of the of the talk i will consider a question which is what would happen if we don't actually know the noise so well so we in the previous session we were considering we actually perfectly knowing the noise so and then we can just, of course, invert the noise and to get a better result. But we, if we don't actually know the noise precisely or so well, okay. So let's recall the setting of the problem. Um, so we have la n layers of the quantum circuit that we want uh, want to implement. So this is our ideal result. But the experimental result we actually have. Uh, have layers of noise and like no, will come with our ideal circuit, and we uh, the error mitigation is trying to uh, trying to achieve the channel inverse and to make it uh, make the error mitigation result as close as possible to the ideal one. So this is the setting of the problem. So as I mentioned, a lot of papers just assume okay we know what's the noise are in the, in the system and we know it perfectly also for free. If we go to the lab, the, the experimentist we will, will tell us what's the, what's the noise look like and what's the parameters. But this is all, not always true. We don't actually always perfectly know the noise. Or we know it to some precision. So it's very natural to come up with the question is, uh, what if we don't actually know the noise so well? So, like the imperfect knowledge of the noise, how it would affect the, the noise channel inverse, then how it affect the, the, the error mitigation result. This is the question that we want to answer. Okay, so this question is a little bit cheeky before we, we discover the, the, follow, the following map structure. So first of all, we have uh, input state over here. Um, this uh, horizontal direction is the direction of the ideal circuit, which is unitary and uh, CPTP. This is the ideal density matrix we have, and this is the ideal uh, expectation value of uh, uh, operator A that we care about. Um, but because of noise, our experimental outcome is actually uh, have a distance from the ideal output. So the so the um, so the real opri, um, real implementation is actually taking it to this one, All right? Uh, and uh, ideally, we want the error mitigation to do is the error mitigation. 
Well, we wanted it to perfectly the map per perfectly map the 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 a uh, map the experimental outcome back to the input state, then implement the inventory. So on this blue the direction, the blue arrows is actually the the ideal or ideal uh, map that we want for the error mitigation, um, and. And it's also the, the the case that we always assume we perfectly know the noise. And uh, because we don't actually have the perfect the knowledge of the noise. So when so the noise actually only in effect the knowledge gap between the uh, between the actual noise and the, our knowledge of noise is actually caused the Cause the the map map back to the uh, the input state row with a little bit arrow over here. We're trying to map to the row row sub in, um, but it's not actually mapped back to that. There is a gap. Um, but we know what we want ideally uh, perfect, of course. So so the so the horizontal part is actually perfectly known. So from this map, we know the imperfect knowledge of the real. Uh, noise actually affect this part, the R tilde part. And what that tells us is, okay, so so we have uh, several propositions in the paper, but um, I, I think if you want the, the want to know the mathematical detail, you can uh, you can check the thing, uh, you can check the 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 more rigorous way. But I think the the message is more important, the more interesting. Um, so basically saying. The, per, the proposition two is basically saying if we bound the distance between the the R tilde and R. So if we doesn't know the if we even though we not know the noise perfectly, but if the the, the knowledge gap is not that, that huge, we can still bound the distance between we can bound the distance between the error mitigation outcome and the ideal outcome that we want. So this is what proposition two was trying to say. The proposition three is trying to say that the left hand side in a, a, in general is talking about our knowledge of our knowledge gap between the real noise and the 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 the, 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 um, the knowledge gap between the real noise real noise and our knowledge. And the, the right hand side is the actually talking about the the experimental implementation implementation um, accuracy. So it's basically saying if you want to imp, uh, increase your result by the error mitigation process, then you have to know this knowledge better than your experimental accuracy. So this is also pretty straightforward. So it's just the uh, Right hand side is a little bigger, uh, should be bigger than the uh, left hand side. Then you can, you can, you can have the the um, error mitigated result lie between the uh, experimental result and ideal result, which is kind of implement, uh, which is uh, um, improvement of the uh, result that you want. Okay, so we can. Uh, this map is also telling us more. What what does that tell us? Is first of all. Um, we can see all the maps is composed with a part that is the ideal circuit, which is the horizontal line. So that means if we want to, you know, brutally calculate the 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 map, the uh, error mitigation inverse, it actually could be harder than directly simulate the the ideal outcome. So, so the so the horizontal line is basically the is the ideal unitary. So it's basically saying the classical simulation. It could be easier, even easier than the than than the than brutally calculate this map inverse. And the second thing is, if you want to Im want the error mitigation to actually improve your results, it's actually a competition between the experiment accuracy and your knowledge of the noise. If you if your experiment did really really well and it's have high accuracy, and you will need to very finely know the noise in your in your system to actually improve your results. So it will always be a competition. 
That's the message from this inverse map. OK, so um, we after that, we we come up with uh, another question. So the, the follow up question is in order to save parameters normally, you know, in the process of uh, uh, noise characterization, for example, process tomography, uh, we assume the noise to to have some kind of model, for example, to be poly, poly um, to be poly noise or something. Um, but because those those noise assumption can save you some parameters, you, so you don't have to fit all the d square by d square matrix. That's a lot of parameters exponentially growth. Um, but because we have the assumption, it also it's 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 not. Uh, sometimes it will not actually make you arbitrary close to the actual noise because you you simplified. Um, so what's the gap? Well, so so in that in this case, even though you perfectly you tried your uh, your best to get an optimized result for your error error characterization, but it's not arbitrary close to the actual noise. So so this is a you know natural question to, that we came up with. So um, we also came up with a kind of naive example. So the naive example setting is. Uh, assume the noise, the system actually have uh, poly noise in the system, but uh, the the somehow the theoretist or the experimentist believe the channel to be a depolarizing channel. So this this is the depolarizing channel parameters. It has more symmetric. You can see it has more symmetric in this in this noise, and so so if so this channel mismatching basically means. If you believe that's to, that that is a, a depolarizing channel, then you try to uh, try to optimize the lambda to best fit to your result. And um, so we got an example that if you choose the poly channel to be, if your poly channel is actually uh, with this, these parameters, so this is the the, the noise actually in, in your in your device. And um, we try the best to fit the uh, fit the parameter over here. And this is the the optimal result that you can fit from this depolarizing channel. And you believe your knowledge, then you try to invert the channel. This is the channel inverse you get um, because you believe your your channel estimation. Then you compose your uh, channel to the noise channel, and that's what we got. And so this is the numerical, the simple numerical result we uh, we we get out from that example. So you can see actually the noise channel. The first of all, the noise channel is actually not making the poly Z uh, expectation value first. You can see all the red dots set in the in the green circle. And uh, but your recovery or the or the thing you did for error mitigation is actually making these poly Z or expectation value first. And also the fidelity, because the the um, D, D inverse this map is HPTP, not CPTP anymore. So numerically, the the um, the density matrix come out with this channel composition is not a valid uh, density matrix anymore. So you you get um, you know, so that's why you get a fidelity which is larger than that. So what this graph tells us is you can see the the channel the the, or the error mitigation process is not improve your expectation value, but it looks like you it improved your fidelity. So this is actually kind of a warning message we have for the error mitigation. So when we are when we were implement the we, those um, quantum channel inverse, we should be very careful. If you have the perfect knowledge. Um, then of course you know the, that's that will give you the best result. But if you don't actually know the noise so well, and you brutally try to do that, and your estimation is not so great, it will give you some uh, some kind of trouble. So this is the warning message we came out with this uh, with this question. And yes, uh, this this will be the the last part of my talk. 
So the take the take home message of this um, of of this work is first of all, uh, error, error correction is the um, the process of you know encoding, decoding, encoding, decoding. Try the best to to preserve the 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 information in your quantum state, and the error mitigation is trying to achieve. Um, the channel inverse, mostly by not increasing the dimension or not introduce too much redundancy. And we know that um, the error mitigation doesn't preserve, preserve some quantum resources like entanglement and coherence. Um, and we also find a new way and a better way to build a quantum channel inverse. For the invertible case, of course, every like uh, every everything is the same because the inverse is unique. But for the non-invertible case, we find the quasi-inverse that's better than the more parallel inverse. And we also understand a little bit better of the superoperator representation itself. Um, we also upper bound the performance of uh, error mitigation protocols based on our knowledge of quantum of the noise channel. And we also um, we also mentioned that if you brutally implement or calculate the channel inverse, it could be worse or more cost, uh, have spent more um, classical resources to, it will be more expensive the, than the classical simulation of ideal results. And the last message is, be careful when you are dealing with those HPTP maps, because HPTP maps can actually give you some um, non-physical results, but we also know CPTP map is not very is not that powerful when when you don't have uh, redundancy introduced into your system. So, so this this is like a warning information. You know, it's um, so be careful when you are implement the error mitigation. Um, so if you know the knowledge, or if you know your channel well, then that's good. If you don't know the channel so well, it's probably not going to give you better results. Um, and there's, of course, there's a lot of question can can be asked and need to be answered. So we also we already talked about the robustness of the the, the HPTP map can need to be recon need to be seriously considered. Um, and also the computational efficiency, because we do the for for constructing the inverse, we do the Jordan decomposition, which is pretty. Uh, it's not very. It's not very efficient, especially when the dimension of the the system goes large, exponent exponential large. Um, and also, uh, the third question we, we can ask is: in the quantum error correction, mathematicians get a get motivation to ask question, all kinds of questions on CPTP map. But because the error mitigation um, protocols, we can ask a lot, all kinds of questions on HPTP map. So all the questions that uh, was answered uh, in CPTP map, we can be asked uh, in the HPTP map again. And also, we um, because we were talking about, you know, we, we want the knowledge of, of the channel. It's close to the actual channel. So, but how do we get this this knowledge? Is by maybe by sampling. So the what's the sampling cost related to the to, to your knowledge gap? And there's a lot also a lot of question that can be asked as well. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, and uh, thank you for spending time with me and uh, listen to our new results. And if you have any comments or questions that can email me, this is my um, this is my working email. And uh, thank you again for the organizer to invite me to give this presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Ping. Uh, are there you. any questions? From the audience, uh, there is one question. Uh, maybe you can come. Yeah. Hello, I'm Yanqi. Uh, I have uh, two questions. On to on sure. Uh, yeah. And maybe it's in the in, in here. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh. Uh, the first question uh, is: uh, to, uh, to, You mentioned that the QEC and QEM the difference. I'm curious. Uh, yeah. uh, why can you uh, mathematically consider HTTP HP, map uh, than than CPTP map? And you you said a reason that 
uh, the CBTV map is physically implementable, but uh, wh what mm -hmm. is the reason you, you can consider such kind of HPTV map? Uh, even even though it is not practically, uh, uh, you can you can build build one. What is the reason? Uh, so 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 um okay. Are you asking me why I'm considering HPTP map even though it's not uh, physically implementable? Is this your question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, that's my question. The first question is sure. why, why can you uh, consider these mathematical structures even even though it is not practically? Uh, this is a good question. First of all, um, any HPTP map can be decomposed to be C two CPTP map um, minus each other. So you can have phi one minus phi two uh, give you any HPTP map. So, uh, so there is other. I think this paper talks about um, how to implement HPTP map. Uh, I can show you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, also, yes. Okay. Great. Uh, so I will I will show you that particular. Uh, okay. So, so uh, yeah. HPTP map from from some CPTP map, please for it. Yeah. So it's not uh, the easy, for, uh, very easily. It's not. It's depend. It depends. But um, yeah, it's uh, every HPTP map can be decomposed to. Uh, CP map, TP map minus another CPTP map. In this particular paper, they, they are they are considering like uh, the multiplication. So so you don't have to. So so that, well, that's why they consider more of the CPTP map plus each other. But um, you know, mathematically, you just you you just need like two two CPTP map to to do that. That's the first thing. The second thing is. Consider the a lot of if you are familiar with the error mitigation uh, methods, they are not always implement those, those maps. They sometimes they just uh, you know do a little bit uh, you know uh, change to their measurement result, and uh, they say okay, by doing this much we we are actually pushing it towards the ideal results, and they are actually not implemented on the on the system. So 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 that's why uh, I also consider HPTP map because uh, you don't need a, like physically implement it in the error mitigation okay. scenario. Uh, that's my question because I'm not familiar with that. So 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 it's a, yeah, oh, it's just, all right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question. So my other uh, people also have similar uh, questions. <laughs> Sorry, in the mathematical yeah. aspect, uh, because Pedro just asked a question, I want to ask more. You, you say that the mm, more sure. uh, you consider uh, you consider quasi inverse uh, than the most most inverse. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in my understand, uh, I, I don't. I'm not sure whether my understanding is right. So I, <laughs> I speak. I speak. It's once. okay. So is, is that the, the more because the more inverse will inverse the eigenvalues, and so that the so that the trace uh, and because every eigenvalues are inverse, so the trace will uh, not. <laughs> not preserved. So uh no, it's the more parallel inverse trying to invert the singular value. Yeah. Okay. So, so because so, singular yeah. value is just like uh at some just some kinds like a absolute value of the the original eigenvalue. So intuitively the, the trace will not preserve, is that right? Uh okay, so so um Singular value not always equal to eigenvalue. Singular value equal to eigenvalue when the when, when the matrix is the Hermitian matrix. Um, so, so that's why the the structure not always uh, equal to each other. Singular value why it's so important in a lot of cases is because when when you are dealing with another square matrix, then if it's not a square matrix, then you cannot do Jordan decomposition anymore. Because in our setting, we we said that uh, the input dimension and output dimension is the same dimension, so okay. so it's a square matrix. So that's okay. why we so can do the Jordan decomposition. Okay. Uh, so is that an intuitive uh, thinking? So why why is the quasi inverse will preserve the the trace? <laughs> so is sure. there, uh, yeah. More yeah. So yeah, it it it's actually from the construction. You can you can see my screen, right? Uh, can you see my mouse? Yes. Also. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, so this is the Jordan decomposition of the your original noise channel, and you see these Q, right? 
this Q actually carries the it carries the eigenvalues and I generalized eigenvalues of this this uh, this matrix. So and in the this is our construction of quasi inverse and we kept those Q's around. So so is the Q over here is not the is not the the, the eigenvalues uh, eigenvectors and the generalized eigenvectors of n, n, n plus anymore. But uh, it, it kind of we kind of preserved the structure to carry it around. So actually from there we have a completely basis. Um, yeah, because because Q is invertible. So we, we got a kind of completely basis for expanding the, the, the space. So that's and the by and then, and the, those Q's the basis is actually trace preserving through the channel. And uh, you, if you want to see the details, you can check the proof of the serum too. It will give you a very clear idea why that's why that works. Thanks. Oh, oh, that's good. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, yeah. Part, in the last part, you think that um, for practical, uh, you consider more practical issues, but I think yeah. the the SVD has another advantage uh, when you are doing numerical calculations. But the Jordan form uh, is a uh, lack of a uh, good computation method. Is that right? Um, I, I will not say SVD is 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 bad is always better than the than the Jordan okay. form. Yeah. So I, I don't think I, I don't think there is a significant advantage from SVD um, over the over the over the Jordan form. Um, but the the problem is if we are dealing with a channel that uh, doesn't have the same input and output dimension, then you 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 are you are screwed. <laughs> you, you are not you are so, not uh, able to yes, use the that's, Jordan that's but, yeah. um, in, oh, Also, in my memory, I, I think that the SVD will be popular in classical because then that's easy to compute. So, so I, okay. I just uh, not sure uh, if whether the Jordan form will be computed in the same efficiency that's my question that's a good question <laughs> so i don't like i don't 100 percent know the result but uh in, in my impression they are not very different yeah so okay, okay. thank you that's my question thank you for your questions any other questions hi Lim Hin. yeah thank you for your nice talk i have a very uh, maybe naive and rough question. I'm not so sure. Uh, in, in your naive uh, interpretation in the error mitigation in the beginning, yeah. you, we, we cannot recover the the true message. We can only recover the the, the distribution in principle. If, if yeah. we if, even if we know the noise model. So, in in your setting later on, uh, uh, HTTP map. Are you trying to say if you somehow just found the difference of this noise model, so you can recover the distribution uh, within some true, true, true distribution and also correct the, the message? Uh, is, uh, is, is there any uh, reason behind this you can recover the message in your map? Oh, ah, okay. So, so in a quantum setting, the the local measurement is not the message. The message is actually the the entanglement. So the okay. so the, in a quantum setting, in this um in this shared the uh, bell pair like setting, uh, the the message is not the local measurement. Yeah. So so as in, even in a quantum setting, it doesn't recover the message. So 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 how how what do you recover? I mean. Oh, OK, so so like if um, Bob knows what, what what his local area is and he can also do a bunch of. So first of all, if the you know, if your E, if your uh, noise channel is not a unitary channel, which is often the case, it's not a unitary channel, um, then you don't have a CPTP map. Um, yes. What do you can? Yeah, what you can do is, you know, based on the knowledge of uh, E uh, inverse, you can Bob do, did some measurements and based on this ma this measurement uh, based on the knowledge of e he, he can he can uh, push this this uh, result a little bit and he says okay this is our error, miti error mitigated result and I trust it to be closer to the ideal output so this this can be done by a lot of um, 
already exist uh, error, mitigate, error mitigation protocols. For example, one of the uh, one of the, the the famous ones called quasi probability. Uh, that what what that um, what that protocol does is. Uh, you you have HPTP inverse, right? If you you if you don't have a unitary channel, so the they decompose the the HPTP map to a series of uh, CPTP map, and uh, implement those simply uh, in, implement those um, CPTP map for several for different uh, route and uh, combine those uh, combine those like measurements together uh, linear linearly together then. Say okay, this is our mitigated result. Yeah. So, like basically all the existed um, error mitigation uh, protocols can do can can do improve implement uh, improve those the local message better. Yeah. That yeah yeah I know, but uh, in your purpose here, what what's the more advantage to to deal with this? Oh okay. So, so the difference between in a quantum setting is that um, error correction you need uh, you need redundancy you need uh, more qubits to encode one qubits. So, but the error correction uh, error mitigation doesn't need that. That doesn't need like I I don't need to encode my one qubit to three qubit or five qubit, right? And uh, and and I just do the local measurements. And if oh I only care about Bob's, you know local measurements you think about uh, if you think about in the context of quantum computing um a lot of time you actually just want to know the expectation or value of a particular operator that's what you want right in that uh, in that scenario you just you can just do error mitigation and also there is also some very useful uh, um ones depending on the device uh, one example is the super, uh, the superconducting connecting qubits. The measurements error is actually pretty bad, but because the measurement error is on the last step, right? So it doesn't scramble with all uh, the previous circuit. So you can just and also people are saying the measurement error is actually a Markovian error. So it's purely classical. You just uh, basically do something to your measurement results by by that locally. You can improve your your precision, so so that's the useful that's some of the useful case, and also different protocols are protocols are different for good for different things, but essentially they're they're trying to reach that uh, channel inverse in in different ways. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Thank you. No problem. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Mingping. Uh, any other questions, maybe? Uh, maybe from the audience online. Uh, if not, I have only one quick question, I think. Uh, so with this last bit that you were comment on now, uh, do you think your your uh, analysis could be used in some way to improve some of the existing protocols, say? Say in the, for example, for the this quasi probabilistic uh, error mitigation, for example, to alleviate the sampling overhead or something like that. Um, I think the message for the last part, um, this is also a very good question. I, I have thought about that. Um, the, so, so I think the, the message on the last part is basically saying, you know, you, if, even though you're trying to do, for example, the quasi probability protocol, you need to be careful about what you say about your noise. You like you you can use a like very raw like uh, knowledge of the noise to to implement, and actually the result might be worse. So this is the message. I think we we are basically saying we need more sample. We need a more uh, more precise um, proso, proso, pro, process tomography result or some kind of way to characterize the noise better to care to catch the essence. All right, thank you. And just lastly, uh, because maybe this was said in one of your first uh, slides, the Markovian assumption, like have you ever uh, thought about going beyond the Markovian assumption? We like to think uh, about things like non-Markovianity and so on. Uh, so yeah, I just wonder if you have yeah. considered this. Yeah. 
Oh, we haven't considered that yet, but this is a good question and it, that's something that we can um, work on. Yeah, so you can consider non-Markovian, but the, the, the structure of the map will be kind of different because and, and you will need to consider how do you separate the, the, the noise from, from your circuit. Sure, OK, thank you very much. No problem. Uh, okay, one last question. Uh, I think uh, I think we'll we'll let you go uh, to sleep already, or if you're gonna party or something. I don't know. Oh no, there's no <laughs> party in Waterloo now. We have a hundred <laughs> daily new cases. We don't party. Okay, yeah, that's true. All right. Well, then maybe yeah, just to sleep. Uh, it's already late for you. So thank you very much uh, for your time and for such a good talk. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm happy to talk to you guys. Yeah, and thank you for the good session. Thank you very much. OK, well, uh, I think I have to stop recording or is it? Yeah. yeah. So I, I will leave now. Bye bye. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank, yeah, you. thank you very much. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye.